we're going to begin our discussion today by taking a look at the silver maple forests of the floodplain of the Connecticut River in southern Connecticut in the town of Portland. Portland is a little bit south of Hartford and Hartford which also sits right on the Connecticut River is protected from floods of the river by a system of dikes. Now whenever you do things like that, whenever you start restricting water flow in one part of a river, that water has to end up somewhere else. And Portland is one of those somewhere else places. So although dike systems can reduce flooding in one part of a river, it can make flooding in other parts of a river worse. And that introduces our topic today. We're going to finish up talking about water resources and from there we're going to go into the topic of soil and soil resources. Now questionable uses of floodplains are simply one issue in the larger topic of global problems with water resources. This map illustrates another issue. This is a map that's generated by NASA, National Aeronautic and Space Administration, that illustrates the status of the aquifers in the United States during the year 2011. The deeper blue areas represent areas that have had a net plus in terms of aquifer recharge, whereas the redder areas on the map indicate places in the country where aquifers have lost water over time. And if you recall from the news, the area of East Texas and throughout a good deal of the Southeast has suffered a substantial drought in recent times and that is what's led to this particular map. Although in general midwestern parts of the United States have suffered from long-term aquifer depletion. Still another issue of global significance is that of saltwater intrusion into aquifers. This occurs in coastal areas and this is an illustration here from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration of a saltwater intrusion issue in Georgia. When freshwater is pumped from aquifers near the coast, it can create a situation where if sufficient fresh water flow into the aquifer is not present, then that water will get replaced by salt water filtering in from the ocean. And so you can see the pathway in this illustration of how that can happen. Coming in deep and then seeping through fractures and rocks up into upper aquifer layers. So here is a summary of these and several other kinds of water resource issues. We have issues on floodplains with diking leading to flooding in areas that otherwise might not have flooded so severely. We can have issues with groundwater being removed faster than the recharge rate of aquifers, hence the supply of groundwater drops when fresh water is removed from aquifers too rapidly we can also have a situation where saltwater intrusion can occur. Other issues include what happens when we try to go grow crops in areas that are 
arid. If you have insufficient irrigation of those crops, then the irrigation you do put on can dissolve salts and mobilize them so that they accumulate on the surface. This is actually what destroyed several ancient civilizations like the uh, civilization in Mesopotamia and I think there's evidence also for some of the early South American Indian civilizations being significantly impacted by inadequate irrigation in arid climates. There has to be enough irrigation so that the salts are flushed out of the surface layers of the soil. Then there are industrial processes which can produce pollutants which can get into our water. The term effluent is uh, noted here. Effluent refers to that stuff that can come out of factories and have a negative impact on water. The whole topic of pollution is one that we'll talk about at great length at a later time, however. This next slide gives us a little taste of things that we will be talking about in much greater detail under the heading of other topics. If we consider briefly, however, the topic of water conservation, these are some issues that come to mind. Using appropriate irrigation methods, especially in places with more arid climates. One method is referred to as drip irrigation. Another issue relating to water conservation in arid areas is minimal soil tillage, which means that you don't do a lot of plowing of the soil. And again, we will talk more about some of these kind of techniques. These result in less water being needed and therefore less stress put on an aquifer. Treatment of various classes of waste such as agricultural waste and municipal waste can also return water in pretty good condition back into the water supply. Technology exists for cleaning up water pretty thoroughly if we are willing to invest the effort into doing it. In the municipal arena, doing things like making use of household gray water, which is water that comes out of things like dishwashers and stuff like that, shower water, those can be recycled and used for other kinds of purposes in the house, like flushing toilets. And especially in arid climates, again, these kind of things can be a significant saving factor in terms of how much water we need to use. We can also do things like make use of human waste and animal waste, remove them from water and actually turn them into fertilizer. The city of Milwaukee does this, for example. They produce a product from their municipal wastewater called Milorganite, which you can go to the feed store and buy. It is a very high nitrogen and high iron organic fertilizer, which is also extremely clean in terms of contaminants. It tends to have less in the way of contaminants than most commercially made mineral fertilizers. Another issue, especially in island environments and places where there's limited available fresh water, but seawater is available, is you can use a process called reverse osmosis, which removes salts from the water and produces a drinkable product. When I lived in the tropical Pacific, 
we drank reverse osmosis water every day. We drank that and we drank rainwater because there was only a very limited supply of fresh water on that island as is typical for many of those small Pacific Islands. With that, we've come to the end of our discussion of water resources. And we're going to turn our attention to what this photograph shows. Soil. Now this is a rather interesting pile of soil, to be sure. So let's talk about it for a minute. We are looking at the cliffs on Block Island, Rhode Island. This is where 16, 18,000 or so years ago, this is where the Wisconsin Glacier came to a grinding halt. The southern terminus of the glacier. So as the forces of ice advancement reached equilibrium with the forces of melting back. The glacier sat relatively stationary at this point for quite some time. And as the ice continued to melt here, all the debris which had been picked up in the ice got deposited here. Hence you see these giant cliffs. These are not the only cliffs that were formed by the glacier. You can see them along Long Island. You can see them at a number of places on the south shore of Massachusetts, on the offshore islands in Massachusetts. So this is an area referred to as the terminal moraine of the glacier. There are actually, behind this area, some recessional moraines where the glacier began to melt back and then paused again. But in any event, what we have here is a pile of unconsolidated material for the most part. Material which was weathered away by the forces of wind and water into tiny particles the mineral component of what we refer to as soil. And this phenomenon is part of a larger process that we refer to as the rock cycle. So let's talk a little about that. If we look at the very base of those cliffs, we do find some interesting looking formations. You find these accumulations of sand grains and rounded pebbles in a kind of a semi-solid condition. What it looks like is going on here is that all these unconsolidated materials are again consolidating into something that we might refer to someday as a rock. This particular kind of feature here, geologists would usually refer to as a conglomerate rock. And this is conglomerate rock, the re-cementing of these sediments into a solid material. Now on the Rhode Island mainland, there are some substantial outcrops of this rock right here, this kind of steely gray, rather handsome kind of a colored rock. This is an outcrop of a rock referred to as pudding stone, which is rather like that incipient conglomerate we were looking at, but it's gone even one step further the pebbles that you can still see in this material have been stretched out through metamorphic processes, heat and pressure for long periods of time. This is of course much much older rock than that stuff on the beach on Block Island. Now 
as it turns out, these outcrops are important for another reason as well in American history. This is the view from one of the outcrops, and we're looking down into a place which to this day is still referred to as Paradise Valley. It's a particularly idyllic kind of a location. Much of it's been set aside as preserved today. It is a place where in the 19th century the great American artist John LaFarge came to work and painted a number of memorable scenes from this very vantage point right here. Not all of this region is preserved, however. As you can see in this picture here, part of the area is quarried for pudding stone, which is a valuable commodity in the construction industry. In any event, let's go back to the beginning in our discussion of soil and its relationship to the materials that it comes from. This is a photo of a volcano, a young volcano, sitting inside of a much larger, much older volcano, the rim of which you can see in the distant background. This is on the island of Bali in Indonesia, part of the Ring of Fire and if you look in the foreground you can see a big black area which is a fairly recent lava flow so this is the stuff that came up from deep in the earth that molten magma that came out as lava and cooled on the surface this is the place where rocks begin now we're looking at the consequence of volcanic activity that occurred 200 million years before that in the previous picture. This is a kind of rock called basalt which is of igneous origin. It's something that results from cooling of molten material that came from deep in the earth this is a basalt ridge in central Connecticut, which is part of a much larger formation of basalt ridges that extend over much of the northeast. Now, this igneous basalt is a very hard rock, and so it weathers very slowly, but it does weather in response to wind and water and physical, mechanical grinding of rocks against each other, it does wear down very slowly over time back into particles, what we call sediment, and which we could also refer to as the building blocks of soil. So, weathered igneous rocks that sediment from them can again reform into other kinds of rocks like we're looking at here, sedimentary rock. This is red sandstone in Utah. Now this sandstone, as you can see in this photograph, is also in the process of weathering. Again for the same kinds of reasons, wind action, water action, and so on. And so this is again becoming sediment. And that sediment can still again reform into a new generation of sedimentary rock. Or if it's subjected to intense heat and pressure, it might become a metamorphic rock like that pudding stone we were looking at earlier. Now here's another view not far from the last one in southern Utah where the Colorado River runs through this landscape. Notice the banding pattern that you can see in these sedimentary rocks here. Notice also that they 
have been uplifted some so that they're not level with the with the present ground they're kind of at an angle to it what you can see from this photograph is a clear image of how water erodes rock over time this river has created this valley that it's sitting in and eroded those surrounding rocks creating these cliffs that you see in large part here's one last view of the Colorado River Valley which shows the layer upon layer of sedimentary rock that's been eroded over the millennia by water action but also wind action this is now a rather arid region and so water erosion alone can't account for all that you see here all of these thoughts bring us to this overview image which is a very simplified diagram of the rock cycle this relationship between the various classes of rock and various kinds of earth processes so let's begin with the magma in the upper right corner of the slide magma can break through to the surface in a volcano and cool and develop into one of the classes of igneous rocks but it can also cool more slowly deeper in the earth and develop into other classes of igneous rock like granites now once the igneous rock is exposed it can begin to weather and as it weathers it winds up becoming various small particles which we can refer to as sediments I did not include the sediment stage in this image just for simplification purposes but as you go from igneous rock to sedimentary rock there has to be a sediment stage in between and then that sediment can re-solidify as sedimentary rock much like you see in the background of this image on the other hand igneous rocks can be subjected to heat and pressure deeper in the earth and in those kinds of instances it can metamorphose igneous rocks might become something like nice which is spelled g-n-e-i-s-s it's a very common form of metamorphic igneous rock that you can find around the world now just like igneous rock metamorphic rock can also weather and as it deteriorates it will also like igneous rock become various classes of sediments and then the sediments can reform into other kinds of sedimentary rocks alternatively sedimentary rocks can undergo metamorphosis and become metamorphic rock so limestone for example can metamorphose to marble so let's do all this again in the form of a summary slide so what we've been talking about is that rocks are continually formed broken down and reformed magma can develop into various classes of igneous rocks depending upon the rate of cooling which will influence things like crystal size in the rock so some of the classes of igneous rocks like some of the pegmatites have very large crystals in them and then igneous rocks can weather and reform as sedimentary rock or they can be altered and form metamorphic rock if they are subjected to temperature and pressure typical kinds of igneous rocks are things like granites pegmatites basalts several of which we've taken a look at whereas classes of sedimentary rocks would include shale and limestone and sandstones 
and common metamorphic rocks include things like schists and slate and marble and gneiss. Slate, by the way, is a metamorphic kind of a shale. And one last point to be made is that among the most common elements in all these kinds of rocks are oxygen, silicone, and aluminum. Now that's not to say that there aren't a number of elements in addition to those that are present, but these are typically the most abundant elements in crustal rocks on the earth. Now while we're on the topic of the rock cycle, there's one other kind of rock that is worth mentioning, and that's coal, which is a kind of a sedimentary or a metamorphic rock, depending upon what kind of a state it's in. And it is the product of life activities. So like other kinds of rocks, it's produced over time in response to pressure and heat and dehydration, decomposition, other kinds of chemical activities. But it differs in being very carbon rich. It also tends to have quite a bit of sulfur in it, particularly certain kinds like one of the classes of coal called bituminous. Generally speaking, we divide up kinds of coal into a couple categories. There's lignite, which is very low grade, poorly developed coal. Then there's bituminous coal, and that coal seam that you see in the background on this photograph here, that's bituminous coal, basically like a sedimentary rock. And if it is subjected further to heat and pressure and all that sort of thing, it can metamorphose into anthracite, which is the most highly prized kind of coal for industrial kinds of purposes. Coal deposits are widespread in North America and several other regions around the world, like China, but uh, among the biggest deposits in the world are right here in North America, particularly associated with the Appalachian Mountains. Now, by means of introduction to our final topic under the heading of Earth Systems and Resources, let's talk a little bit more about that sediment stuff that comes out of the weathering of the various classes of rock the building blocks of what we call soil. We can talk about the various particle sizes that we can subdivide these sediments up into. And this slide illustrates those various sizes in their comparative relationship. So the biggest sediment particles we might refer to as coarse sand. Now we could also talk about gravel, which might be bigger yet, but let's stick specifically with those things that we normally classify as soil particles. So we have coarse sand going up to about two millimeters in size. At less than a millimeter we have medium sand and smaller particles still would be fine sand, maybe about 0.1, 0.2 millimeters even smaller particles would be the silts, which are an important component of many of our typical soils. And then the tiniest particles of all are the clays, which are generally two microns or even less in size. And the clays are also interesting for several other reasons in addition to just their tiny size. They tend to have a rather different kind of mineralogy than silts. So the specific minerals that are present to 
and the differ and the details of their chemical composition make them important components of soils because of the kinds of things that they can do and we'll talk more about that as we get into the next topic groups of clays include things like kaolinites, montmorillonites, illites are typical kinds of clays. And so we will discuss all this stuff in greater detail in our next sh show.